Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest in the Geotox Express series. My name is David McKittrick. I'm Outreach and Training Manager here at Blue Marble Geographics. And during today's session, it's a little bit of a different approach for us. We're going to be uh, hearing from a number of veteran Global Mapper users, initially about their early experience with the software, uh, but also about their their reviews of the latest release, version uh, 23 for Global Mapper Pro. We're going to hear from uh, some folks who have uh, uh, gone along with us for the journey as Global Mapper has evolved. Um, also today we're being joined by a couple of folks from uh, Blue Marble Geographics. Patrick Cunningham is going to be joining us, company president, to tell us a little bit about uh, the acquisition of Global Mapper and Mike Childs. I think he's taken some time away from writing code. Uh, the initial developer of Global Mapper is going to be sharing a little bit about uh, the early development process and maybe sharing a little bit of a hands-on, uh, showing us how the, the software uh, came into being. Um, before we get started, uh, our Obligatory housekeeping issues. Um, many of you I know have been in our webinars before. Quick reminder, you are in listen-only mode. We've already had one question come in already, um, if you can communicate verbally. Unfortunately, with the numbers that we get in our webinars, that's not possible. So yeah, unfortunately, you can hear us. Uh, we are not able to hear you. Um, you can ask questions over there on the right side of the panel or on your screen. You should see the go to webinar panel. You'll see a questions tab in there. Please, please ask questions today. This is your opportunity to find out from some of the experts <laughs> and indeed some of the veterans about their experiences and indeed about uh, how Global Mapper has evolved. So ask questions. We will answer those questions in real time, um, verbally. Um, please keep the questions relevant. I know a lot of you want to ask questions about uh, non related topics. Um, if there are questions that come in that are not relevant, we will take those offline and follow up with you directly. The session is being recorded, so if you want to recap some of the content we're going to be covering today, uh, that should be posted within a few days. And obviously, if you're watching the recording of this, um, you're not going to be able to ask questions in, in real time, but we will put an email link in the description uh, so you can follow up with any questions that you may have. Um, some upcoming events to remind you of. Um, we are getting close to the end of the year. Uh, we have one more Geotox Express session scheduled for a week from today. Um, this is a case study and um, uh, derived or, or based on um, a, an article that one of my colleagues wrote recently on the um, use of Global Mapper for viticulture suitability, basically analyzing uh, the various components of an area to determine uh, how or, or the um, whether a, a vineyard can be applied can be set up in that location. So we're going to be hearing about that workflow, gu guiding you through various components of the software to, to illustrate that process. Um, we have already outlined our sessions for the 2022 season, starting right after the start of the year. Announcement will be coming soon. You can go to our website and get more information. As you're aware, registration is required for these. Um, please feel free to sign up when we make those announcements and you will have your slot. Um, I also want to remind you about something that uh, we, we've announced a couple of times over the last few months, and that is the Blue Marble Academic Scholarship. Um, this is a program or a, a, um, a scholarship award that's open to any undergraduate or graduate student um, to participate. You submit something that you've written or a poster or a project report, very flexible in terms of the submission requirements, what you, you submit to us. Um, a student, one student will receive 500, a $500 scholarship as well as a copy of Global Mapper Pro and the newly released Global Mapper Pro. So we've upped the ante this year. We're actually giving away a copy, your own personal copy of Global Mapper Pro. So um, you have a couple of weeks to submit. I know a lot of you have been doing, a lot of students have been doing work in Global Mapper already. Maybe the time to wrap up those projects. Um, you can get more information on that and indeed our other academic programs at the URL listed below. Um, go ahead and submit those projects. And again, you will be in the running for our $500 scholarship with a copy of Global Mapper Pro. Um, big event coming up in January. This is our annual 
uh, online user conference. We started this several years ago. Even before the pandemic, we were conducting our user conference in a virtual uh, environment. It allows us to reach a much wider audience, a worldwide audience. Um, the 2022 edition is scheduled for January 26th. It's a free day-long conference. We're going to hear from users. We actually have our, our speakers lined up already, some really fascinating speakers. We're going to hear the latest information about what's going on at Blue Marble. Well, you'll get some tips and tricks uh, from the, some of the technical folks uh, in Blue Marble about how to optimize your use of the software and much more. There's a lot more that's going to be crammed into that session. Registration, once again, is, is open and is required. Even if you don't anticipate being able to attend for the entire day, go ahead and register because as a registrant, you will have access to all of the recordings. So the uh, registration link is live. You'll see the URL on your screen. Uh, again, go ahead and sign up for our online conference coming up. Up, uh, January 26th. Um, okay, before we continue, um, this is an interactive session. We want you to ask questions. We also, we also want you to answer a question. I know a lot of the folks in our audience have been using Global Mapper for quite a while, so we're going to start by asking you a question. On your screen in just a second, you're going to see a poll question. How many years have you been using Global Mapper? You can go ahead and click right on the screen to let us know your response. Less than one, one to five, um, et cetera. And I'm watching the results coming in in real time. Interesting cross section here of, of experience uh, in our audience today. A few of you have been using Global Mapper for quite a while, it looks like. Interestingly, some of you have never used Global Mapper. Special welcome for you folks who have never used the software. Hopefully, you're going to get a little bit of information about, uh, about Global Mapper, and maybe uh, you can take a look at the application, see if it works uh, in your situation. I'll give you a few more seconds just to respond to the question, and we will then close the poll. And I'm going to share the results with you and hopefully you're seeing those on screen. As you can see, fairly even distribution. Uh, quite a few of you are relatively new to Global Mapper. Special welcome, as I mentioned. Number of you have been here for a long time, longer than I would assume that Blue, Blue Marble Geographics has uh, been uh, involved with Global Mapper. I know my personal answer to this would be about 16 years, I believe, I first encountered uh, Global Mapper. So again, thank you for all of you uh, answering the question. And again, you get an idea as to who uh, is um, uh, joining uh, joining us in our session today. Okay, that by way of introduction. Uh, again, we have an esteemed group of panelists with us today. I'm going to ask them all to turn their webcams on so we can go through our introduction. So hopefully technology will cooperate here. Um, let's go ahead and share your webcams, guys. Excellent. Looks like we have all on board. Once again, my name's David McKittrick, again, Outreach and Training Manager at Blue Marble Geographics. Uh, we have three members of the Blue Marble staff. Let's begin with them. Rachel, good morning. Why don't you tell us a little about, a bit about what you do at Blue Marble Geographics? Uh, thank you, David. I am the Marketing Assistant for Blue Marble, and I've been here for almost six years at this point. So if you go to a show or if you watch any of our YouTube videos, I am the voice of most of them for the last year or so. Excellent. And Rachel today is going to be managing our questions as they come in. So, uh, Rachel, please interrupt as needed to ask those questions as they come into the questions panel. Uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about what you do. What do you do at Blue Marble Geographics, Mike? Good morning, David. Uh, I'm the original developer of Global Mapper, as we'll discuss uh, in a moment. So I'm kind of the lead lead developer of the Global Mapper project uh, now. Um, so I've been involved with Global Mapper for over 25 years now and uh, Blue Marble for just over 10. Excellent, excellent. And Patrick, how are you this morning, Patrick? Muted. I'm doing great, David. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm the president of Blue Marble Geographics and uh, oh, I've been around kicking around these halls since 2003. And uh, really excited to hear about our longtime users and, uh, and and how things are going with them with the software and, and, and their stories. So that'll be really cool. Excellent, excellent. So let's let's introduce our esteemed guest. So just to put this in perspective, when we were considering this approach for a webinar, we wanted to reach out to some folks who had been using Global Mapper for some time, and it didn't take us long to find these uh, these folks, uh, long time users. I believe longer than most of the folks who actually work at Blue Marble Geographics. 
Um, we're going to hear a little bit more about how they use Global Mapper in a few minutes, but just for now, why don't we go ahead and just go along the line here, and you can tell us a little bit about who you are, who you work for, et cetera. So, Bob, I'm going to bring with, begin with you. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your background, Bob. Hi. Uh, I'll, I'll first of all say good afternoon. Um, I'm in Glasgow, uh, home of COP26 just now. Um, yeah, I'm a recently retired petroleum geologist, and uh, I was amazed. I went back and looked through all my old archives. I started using Global Mapper in 2002, which must have been one of the first commercial releases, I think. I was surprised at that, but there you go. I have used extensively throughout my working career. I've been a, a consultant geologist mainly. And I found with Global Mapper, I was able to act as like a linchpin. And I found that I could do all sorts of things with Global Mapper that my colleagues couldn't do. And it was incredibly useful to link between the geologists, the geophysicists, um, and all the various other speci specialities. So um, working with disparate data sets, mainly in Africa. Excellent. Well, we're going, to, we're going to hear more about how you use Global Mapper in just a few minutes. We're going to ask you some more specific questions. Chuck, good morning. Mm -hmm. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Um, my name is Chuck Stein, and I'm a co-founder of GeoFusion, which is a 3D software technology company. Uh, we were founded in 2001, and um, what we do is uh, we have a toolkit for building 3D Earth visualization applications, which we license, and we also build applications and the main application we've been working on for the last 10 years is a uh, in-flight flight tracking application, 3D Earth visualization on seatback computers in uh, on airliners for passengers to use. So it's on about 40 different airlines, over a thousand aircraft, and allows you to explore the Earth and um, follow the flight. Oh, excellent. I'm sure we've all seen your work <laughs> going across the Atlantic. Um, Walter, a uh, little, little bit about uh, about your, your company and who you work for, Walter. Good morning, David. I'm Walt Nikolai. Uh, we founded Telesto Solutions in 2001. This must have been the year to start companies. Yeah. I'm an agricultural engineer by training. We do consulting, engineering, and uh, science. Um, our primary clientele are the hard rock mining industry. We do a lot of water rights. I'm in Colorado on the front range of Colorado. We do a lot of water rights work uh, here as well. So thanks for Excellent. inviting me this morning. You're good. delighted to have you folks here, delighted to have you with us and sharing your stories. So, so we're going to begin uh, by kind of painting the picture a little bit. And when we come back to you, the panelists, we're going to ask you, just to, just to prep you, a little bit about your early experience with Global Mapper. We obviously want to bring this up to the current. We're going to have, have you explain or describe what you currently do with Global Mapper or your, your impression of the latest release. But to paint that picture, we're going to start where it all began. So, Mike, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about how the global mapper story began in fact i think if, if we maybe i'll show ahead go ahead and share have you share your screen mic so you sh can maybe show us an early version hopefully technology will cooperate here you should be uh, able to see oh, there we go. mike's screen in just a second and maybe mike as you're doing that tell us a little bit about the story of how global mapper came into being sure uh it all started uh in the the olden days of uh the mid 90s uh, first of all, can you see my screen? The yeah, yeah, we can see it. Uh, so uh, I had to look this up to get the years right. Uh, but in 1995, I was a, a college student at the University of Missouri, Rolla, and uh, Rolla, Missouri. And the U.S. Geological Survey at the time had four big mapping centers across the country, and one was in Rolla. So I was working there as a student. Uh, and, you know, 1995, 1996, Windows 95 had just came out. People were moving to 32-bit. And the USGS was an entirely Unix-based shop, so they didn't have any Windows tools to look at any of their data. Uh, so they figured they'd have the new kid um, go ahead and write one of those because nobody there knew Windows, not that I did either. Um, so we uh, developed an application called DLGD32, which is uh, not a very good name, but it means a DLG, which was the USGS's vector uh, line graph format for their, you know, the vector version of their topo maps. Um, and 32 because 32 bit was the new the new thing back then. Um, so developed that um, the, the first version could just look at the, the DLG digital line graph data and then the next version came out we could do 
DRG, you know, their raster topo product. Um, and then finally DEM, their, their terrain product uh, was in the third version and it added a really simple 3D viewer. Um, sorry, the 3D viewer is a separate application. Um, but, but you could look at it in 2.5D with, with shading and things like that, but, but it couldn't do anything like export or, or anything that might be considered competitive with commercial products. Um, so, so the last version of the, of the USGS one came out in uh, 1998, and I, I graduated, um, went out to do other things. Uh, a couple of years later, they, I guess the USGS had some new formats, so they called me up. They're like, would you want to add some new stuff? We'll release DLGB32. Uh, as open source, so it's not my favorite, so in theory anyone could take it and do what they wanted. Uh, but then I could take it and make a commercial version and maybe add those formats for them in a free version, and they would distribute that for me. So I went ahead and did that, and, you know, sold it on the side while I had another full-time job. Um, and that's when some of these guys came in buying their licenses back in 2001, 2002. Um, if you look at the, the screen I have shared, this is Global Mapper version 4.7. Um, version 4 was the first commercial version. We didn't even show it in the title bar back then. Um, you can see version 4.7 in 2002. Um, if you look at the, uh, the file open list here, you can see there's a much smaller list of uh, supported file types. It's still, still pretty good. It went from the five or six that are supported at the USGS to, uh, I don't know, I guess 25 or something. Uh, looking at here, you know, you had the JPEGs and SID file, DTEDs, uh, DOQ file, uh, all kinds of different uh, stuff was added in there. But if we go in there and load, let's say we'll load just a DEM, and it looks, it, it, it probably looks familiar to you if you load terrain data even in Global Mapper 23 right now, and the, uh, the scale bar and the elevation legend still look pretty similar. There's a lot more options on them now. Um, but, but even in version 4, we had added, you know, a path profile tool and view shed and measure tool and an export to you, know, you can look, there's a, you know, a dozen terrain export formats and similar number of vector export formats. So you got quite a bit going on to version four, and back then it cost like $120 or something like that. Pretty cheap. So then over, over the years, we would do a major release every year. Um, we got up to uh, 2011 was when uh, Blue Marvel approached and, and acquired Global Mapper. Uh, and then after that, we've got a, a big team and things get added at an even faster pace than they did before. And of course, without me drawing the, uh, the toolbar buttons, they look a whole lot nicer in the new version. So I can write code that I cannot draw icons. So, so Mike, I noticed in the when you showed us the uh, interface first, uh, kind of a generic uh, welcome screen. When, oh, yeah. did the, when did the logo came along? Um, people oh, want gosh. to know, when did that logo was, came uh, along? I'd say version seven or eight, there was, um, let me see if I, I think you've got it in the slides, so you can you can find that logo. But yeah, the user didn't like my terrible little graphic here, so they made some what I thought was cool at the time one that had global mapper with a you know kind of a topo map blending into a, a satellite image behind it, and that became the logo. Um, that slide deck you have with the global mapper 12, I think, will show that. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll take a look at that in just a second, kind of bring us up to the modern uh, the modern era. And, that, and for those of you who answered the question about having never used global mapper, to, hold off. This is not the modern version of global mapper. There's a lot more functionality to to come. You'll you'll get that in just a second. Uh, Mike, while we're talking about earlier versions of global mapper, I do have a question. Um, from an audience member asking if DLGV32 is still available somewhere. Uh, I looked and I couldn't find it anywhere. I, I don't think it is. It might be archived somewhere on the USGS site. It wouldn't be very useful if it was. Um, in theory, it would still install and run. I mean, I saw Global Mapper 4 just the other day for this and it installed fine on Windows 10. So, so if someone for historical purposes, wanted to install DLGB32 uh, and could find it. In theory, they could, um, but but I don't think it's available. I don't yeah, think I the USGS is hosting the web the website anymore. Yeah, and if, if somebody wants the viewing capability of DLGV32, they can download Global Mapper, and they're going to get that out of the box anyway. So it's it's become a little redundant. So. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, very interesting. Let me go ahead and take this screen back. Um, again, this is a little bit of a, a trip down memory lane, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, let me go ahead and grab the screen again. Now, Mike alluded to the fact that we have some slides here. I'm not sure if you're seeing the full screen. You may need to minimize the webcams, but um, 
Um, behind, let me go ahead and show my screen. Um, behind the webcams, hopefully you're seeing uh, a little bit of a, a view of version four of Global Mapper. Um, scrolling through just the, the progression here, uh, Mike mentioned uh, version 12, it's structurally similar. Uh, you can see the same interface, uh, that yellow background color, which everybody came to know, to love and hate, depending on your use. Um, but you'll see a lot more functionality in here by version 12. Version 12, noting the build date on the interface, was about 2011. This would coincide with when uh, the application was acquired by uh, Blue Marble Geographic. So this is a good time maybe to switch over to Patrick. Uh, Patrick, uh, president of Blue Marble, uh, made the decision at that time that uh, Global Mapper would be a, a good tool to add to, to the Blue Marble suite. Patrick, you want to tell us a little bit about what inspired that decision and what uh, how that transpired at the time? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, so back then, um, you know, so Blue Marble, we, we were founded in about 93. Um, geographic calculator was our claim to fame, still still is a big part of what we do for coordinate transformation or coordinate conversion as some call it. Um, and in that first decade, we developed all kinds of mapping software solutions, um, geographic tracker, uh, geo objects, uh, geo view, and we had um, geographic transformer and geographic translator uh, for file translation. So transformer was focused on raster and translator was focused on vector formats. And um, we just started bumping up against Global Mapper when it came time for folks doing uh, using our file translation software. Uh, it was, um, you know, it was very competitive product uh, and um, had a lot of similar functionality, uh, though a much better viewer um, and actually a viewer centric look. It's kind of funny to think about it, but back then we were so focused on positioning and coordinate systems that we didn't have a map-centric software solution for our file translation. Um, so as we started hearing about Global Mapper and then started playing with Global Mapper, um, we realized you know it was it was a great it was a great tool, and we were at the point where we we're looking to acquire a company and to expand. And uh, you know we. Uh, called Mike up and said, we really like uh, your Global Mapper logo. Um, <laughs> we'd like to meet you. And, uh, and it worked out. Um, and it's, and it, I think probably the smartest thing we did was make sure to bring Mike along with the software. Um, and, um, you know, he, he fit in great with us. He's a pretty easygoing guy, I think, as anybody that's worked with him for a long time knows. And, um, and so, you know, that's how we uh, acquired Global Mapper. Uh, these things take a little while. It's sort of like uh, going through a, a dance or a relationship, but uh, it worked out and we were able to, to, to bring it on board. So, so the obvious question at this stage, back to Mike again, is, is how did your world change in 2011? Obviously, you had been doing this yourself, making your own decisions, um, working your own hours, which if rumors has it, sometimes it was 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. So how did things change for you and how did things change for Global Mapper after the acquisition? Yeah, yeah, those hours were probably the biggest change. They used to be a, a 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. sleeper, so I had to kind of switch, suddenly try and become a morning person all of a sudden, which I'm still struggling with, given the <laughs> caffeine uh, out here. Um, but I mean, it was a transition for a while. It was nice, you know, we have a support team, um, after a few years, there must be a squirrel outside my dog's apartment. Um, but uh, after a couple of years, you know, we had a lot of good support teams, so I could transition away from support, and I got to immediately transition away from sales and really focus on the, the development part, you know, which is the, the, the part I like the most. Uh, and I'm, you know, much better at that than marketing or something like that. Um, so as the years have come along, now we have a nice big team, um, and, you know, people great at handling all the other stuff. So uh, I think it makes the product a lot better with the tech people being able to focus on tech stuff and, uh, and let somebody else draw the icons. Hmm. I and came, sorry, yeah, I came up with a new logo as well. Uh, speaking of which, let's continue our slide. I don't know if you're watching the slides in the background, but this is where we are. This is where it's come. Now it's worthwhile doing a little back and forth comparison, version 12 to version 23. Obviously the development process um, escalated considerably in uh, in uh, after the acquisition. Mike has, has got a support 
uh, team, not only of, of, of folks who deal with tech support and marketing, et cetera, but also other developers as well, um, who are contributing to the ongoing development of this, this application. So again, brief introduction, a little bit of history. Um, you know, those of you who have been along for the ride, maybe some interesting kind of timelines. I should say we do have a, a brief history document on our blog, on our website. If you want to read a little more detail about some of those significant timelines, visit our, our blog site to get that information. Let's turn to our panelists. You guys have been sitting on the sideline too long. Let's let's hear your opinion. Now, obviously, Mike uh, at the time was a lone wolf. Mike was doing this all himself. So I think uh, some of you may have mentioned this during your introduction, but just remind us, wh when did you start using Global Mapper and probably more importantly, why? What was it about Global Mapper that enticed you to take a look and, and add it to your uh, geospatial toolkit? Uh, let's start with Chuck again. How, how did you first encounter Global Mapper and, and again, why? I can't remember exactly how I found it, if it was if I found it or if one of my workmates found it. And maybe we were using the free version. I don't know. I found a receipt in 2002 for $129. Um, and anyway, we started using it then. And, and what one of the needs we had was con, uh, doing coordinate conversion of data sets. Uh, uh, our system uses, uh, we have to process data into our, a format for our 3D Earth visualization, and uh, we start with it in geographic coordinates. Uh, and so we used it a lot for coordinate conversion of data sets or uh, tiling together data sets, uh, public data sets, and uh, chopping them up into smaller pieces in a different um, projection. And also, I remember creating pseudo-colored bathymetric data sets for some different projects. And um, that's that's how we started. Okay. Uh, Walter, what about you? That's uh, really interesting, Chuck, because uh, the reason I was looking for global map, uh, looked at global mapper originally, was that same reason, coordinate transformation. And this had to be uh, pre-2000 um, because I found a free version on USGS site. I went searching for that. Uh, in the mining industry, you know, some of the maps and things that we have to work with date from the 1800s and they had their own coordinate system. And so with the uh, date myself, advent of the internet, and the access to all of the resources uh, trying to marry those 1800 maps with what's out there today. Global Mapper was really the first tool I found and it was free <laughs> to, uh, to help me overlay those uh, different pieces of data. So that, that's how I started with Global Mapper. And I remember the first time I heard it was going commercial, sorry, Mike, uh, I almost cried because I thought this free tool is just like the best thing in the world. Now they're going to ruin it, and but you didn't. So I really appreciate that. You really, really improved it and stuck with it ever since. So yeah, I'll just say that was part of the philosophy at the beginning was you know anything that had been free before you know the viewing and stuff stays free. Um, but when people start to want to export stuff, they got to pay for that. So so let people yeah. get a taste of the good stuff, and then when they want to send it to something else, they got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, a great, great model you came up with. So. Yeah. So, Bob, what about you? I know you told us a little bit during the introduction when you first encountered Global Mapper, uh, maybe elaborating a little bit on, on your first experience. Sure. Yeah. I mean, 2002, I was doing a lot of work uh, looking at uh, geological data from various wells, um, posting the values, and gridding them, and uh, trying to make understandings of thicknesses of sands and so on. But I was bumping up against, just like the others, coordinate issues, and I couldn't work out how to resolve that cost effectively. And I was using a popular software package made by Global Software, uh, 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 Golden Software, and it's them who suggested I give um, Mapper a try, and that's how I how I came at it. I tried the free version; it was good. I thought, well, this is cheap, you know, I've got to have this, and so I bought it, and uh, I never stopped using it. 
Yeah, excellent. I think there's a common thread here, and I know the folks that we've interacted with over the years, when we ask them the question we asked you, more often than not, the answer to how did you find out about Global Mapper is it's word of mouth. Uh, somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, and, and I have to relate my personal experience as a long-time user. I was one of those as well who used it for file conversion, and I was rec it was recommended by one of my work colleagues. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a common thread. Um, I'm going to throw this question out to all three. I'm not sure if this is appropriate to, for all of you, but during that those early years, did you ever have a need, do any of you ever have a need to reach out to ask a question of the extensive tech support team which existed at the time, that being Mike Giles? Did you, did you talk to Mike at that time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, mean, I, I had uh, a whole lot of emails that I had with Mike about questions or possible bugs. Uh, I, I saw one where I found something, uh, extra pixels being added, and he fixed it right away. That was always really impressive to, you know, send an email to somebody and then have a new version available right away. And the other day, Mike said that he found an email from me that of something he still hasn't implemented yet. Oh, we we about to bring that up. <laughs> I'm not waiting though. <laughs> yeah, yeah not that ever, no, that was more a feature request maybe, I'm not sure, yeah, yeah. But bugs <laughs> did get fixed right away just because since I was doing all the support, you know, the sooner I fixed it, the less likely it was somebody else would find it also emailing. So it's kind of mm -hmm. right away and get it out there. I always hate that when I use software and find an issue and it's like, oh, in you know, five years we might fix that bug. Uh, obviously features can take longer sometimes, but uh, kind of yeah. my philosophy and Blue Marvel's philosophy is always to fix bugs as soon as possible. And, you know, with Global Mapper now, we have a daily build out there that for, for brave users that uh, want to get the latest and greatest where there's a, a bug fix or something they want. Yeah, and, and that philosophy continues today. Obviously, during those early days, it was you as the user interacting directly with Mike. Uh, with the acquisition, we have maintained that philosophy. We really depend on input from users. The simple reason being we're not experts in any particular field. It's up to you to tell us what works and what doesn't work for your use cases. So uh, kind of as a general thing, just let us know if there are any issues that you need to uh, to have addressed and we'll try to make sure they're fixed. Uh, most of them, Chuck, I'm sorry, most of those issues are fixed. Maybe, maybe, maybe the additional fixes will happen. Um, so let's bring it up to the, the kind of the modern era. You, you folks have obviously been along for the ride for a long time. Hopefully stick, stuck with Global Mapper, seen it evolve, seen new tools added. Um, we gave you an opportunity to take a look at version 23, and, and with version 23, we also introduced uh, Global Mapper Pro, a new platform to allow us to develop more advanced functionality. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, obviously, you know, you've got something to compare to your early experience with Global Mapper. How does the current release, how does version 23 compare? What was your first impression? Um, again, we can just go around the group here. Let's start with Chuck again. What was your first impression when you took a look at version 23? Well, um, for a long time, I was holding on to version 12, um, and then we finally upgraded, and uh, I don't know, maybe to 22 or 23, and um, it was mainly for a particular project. I needed to update uh, a 30-meter Earth data set and, um, and, and set it up so I could continually update it. and um, with a combination of solid state drives and global mapper, I, you know, it's great. I can, you know, have this whole 30 meter earth data set on the screen. I can bring in hundreds of, or, you know, many gigabytes of uh, other data, 15 meter data that I can update the 30 meter with and then uh, save it out at the 30 meter resolution. Um, it's been really good. I mean, the response, uh, I don't have to wait too long. Um, that's been really great. And uh, there's, I'm just discovering a lot of the other functionality. I'm also using um, the spatial op, some of the spatial operations to um, uh, intersect um, the data sets I'm updating with my tile data set to figure out which tiles I need to save out and so on. So I'm very pleased. Uh, David, you're muted. 
Thank you, thank you. I was just saying, spatial operations introduced in the last version 22.1 and enhanced significantly with 20 or with version 23 Pro. So, Walter, what about you? What, what did you think of version 23 when you started to kick the tires? You know, uh, initially overwhelmed. It does so much more than DGL 32 <laughs> <laughs> um, Still use it for that coordinate transformation, um, but the functionality in um, mapping floodplains and just our day-to-day -day data management um, abilities, uh, you know, all the attribute searches and uh, the ability to query data and actually make a map of what you want to show immediately. And then, uh, and it was a few versions back when you started actually making the, the map output where you could actually generate a figure for production. Um, and my, my only request is that Give me some text with an arrow on that feature, and I'd I, I'd throw away all my other software. I wouldn't need anything else. <laughs> You, you've taken one of the follow-up questions we're going to be asking in a few minutes is if you had a request for functions. So hold off on that one for the time being, Walter. Right. Mike, have you got your notepad out? You want to have a few things to scribble down here, I think. Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> so, so, so Bob, oh, Bob what, what, did, what was your impression of, of Global Mapper 23 when you, you put it through its paces? Well, before before I say that, I'll just say I am retired now, the last year, year or so. And uh, so professionally, I have, don't need Global Mapper, all the functionality. However, I've let all my other software licenses go over every other bit of software I had, but I can't get rid of Global Mapper because I love it. I, I use it in my civilian life now. I use it a lot to do modeling of, uh, believe it or not, cycle traffic data. So any of the functionality isn't absolutely pertinent to what I do, but I'm so excited just to get a chance of being able to play with it, such as the, the LiDAR mapping and these are in creating 3D models from um, drone data. I looked, I'm looking forward to playing from that with a friend who's got a, got a drone and so on. So it, I'm looking forward to using it as a civilian. So it's a little bit different uh, maybe from the others. Yes, still very relevant, Bob. Yes, de definitely. And you know, your descriptions of how, you, uh, how your use has evolved, it, it reflects one of the things we often hear Global Mapper described as like a Swiss Army knife. It's got so many blades, you can yeah. pull out a blade for Absolutely. a particular function. So, um, again, going to put the three of you on the spot. I want, I want you to answer what is your current favorite Global Mapper tool? What is the go to function that you look at Global Mapper and say, This is my favorite? This is the defining component of Global Mapper. How, what, would, <laughs> what would you think that would be? I see you staring away, Chuck. Did. What, what, what's, what's your favorite Global Mapper tool? Well, I don't have a favorite, but uh, this uh, the spatial operation uh, feature has been between data sets has been very useful. Um, um, I did some work with uh, having large like uh, coastline vector data sets for the whole globe and needed to enlarge them to uh, be off the coast and simplify them and and i was able to do that and that was very nice and walter what's your favorite tool in global mapper you know it, it's really the ability to import data i'll get a project in that we know nothing about and within two or three minutes i'll have a map built um, understanding the topography what data are out there that exist for the project and being able to, again, take that data in a different coordinate system, bring it into real world and, and then export it now to, uh, to my clients and, and uh, other colleagues. It's still my favorite tool is that uh, coordinate transformation. Yeah, inter interoperability. Uh, and Bob, yeah. what's yours? What, what's your favorite tool, Bob? I, I'm gonna kind of echo what Walter has said. I don't have a favorite tool, but if you like a favorite feature of Global Mapper, I can, I could, can import virtually any any bit of data in any format, composite together with everything else that's going. And as an exploration job, working in data poor areas that was so important, and then spit out a map that really means something and helps the understanding. So this ability just to pull anything in and then make a map that means something and helps you do your job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, like to add um, the. Uh, uh, the connection to outside data sources has been really important to me yeah. and being able to add uh, web map services to, you know, 
other data mm -hmm. sources. Um, I hook up to the County of Santa Cruz uh, web map server, and I can use that to compare to what I'm doing, seeing if I'm missing something. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, you, you folks are mirroring a lot of the, the responses we get from other users as well. Um, in terms of that interoperability, uh, Mike showed us the import list from version 4, which I believe were a couple of dozen. At last count, we're up to 320 supported formats. So if for no other reason, that's a reason to have Global Mapper in your, mm -hmm. in your toolkit. Okay, final question. And this is the one you've been waiting for. If you had the power, and I know folks, folks uh, are going to be jealous that you are going to have this power talking directly to Mike. If you could add a new function to Global Mapper, a new feature, a new tool, uh, what would it be? What would you like to see added to, to Global Mapper? Chuck, let's start with you again. Well, I the only thing I can think of is you integrate the, our Geomatrix toolkit in there, and uh, then you'll have 3D Earth visualization. I, it, it's great. There's so much there that I haven't even touched. It's hard for me to think about um, what what to add right now. I, I was just going to say related to that. If in our 23 Pro, we have a uh, you know Python support now, so it's really easy for people to add extensions and new functionality in Global Mapper. So it might be possible now for your team to integrate your Geomatrix tools um, into Global Mapper. We've also had an extension toolkit for a while. That's kind of a DLL-based thing, but it's a lot easier now to do some things with the uh, Python integration. Mm -hmm. So maybe this conversation needs to continue offline. Good. <laughs> um, Walter, what would you like to see added to Google Map? I kind of spilled the beans, but uh, yeah. over my old workflow, I would take a make a Global Map or Map, and then in order to put it out as a final product, I would put out a screenshot, bring it into PowerPoint, so I could draw labels and arrows um, at the things I wanted to call out and, and label. And so a, a labeling tool that's a little more user, I guess text-based, not so much spatially based, right? Would be, yeah. uh, it, be useful for me. Yeah, if, if we were doing a training class right now, I would give you the workaround where you can do that. A little bit of creativity, you can develop those call outs and those arrows, but that, again, we'll leave that one for an offline conversation. Yeah. Uh, Bob, what about you? What would you like to see added to Google Mapper? You know, I almost hesitate to say what else you added because I might find it's already there and I just have never found it. <laughs> but um, I would like the ability to create pie diagrams at a point and you know, import data from, from uh, a text file and you know ratios of different things. So you get a little pie diagram on each location. That's a really useful feature, particularly for ge geologists. Yeah, there is a graphing tool in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we have there a little be. graphing tool, yeah. So, yeah, but um, yeah. Well, a graphing tool doesn't do, does do pie diagrams. Yeah. On the I, screen. I yeah, yeah. I Again, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's that's a few that's conversations that's we'll that's have that's offline to 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 uh, <laughs> kind of elaborate on some of these questions. So, yeah. Well, great. Oh, um, oh, I'm going to have to look up where that was too. I, another developer added that. I know it's in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's hesitating. <laughs> Should be right in one of the main drop down menus, analysis. Yeah. yeah, graph and chart manager is under the analysis menu. You can you can generate a pie chart derived from attributes from some features you have loaded. You can you can generate uh, various graphic representations. Folks, that's the it end of our like presentation. Might... Oh, sorry, David. Sorry, Rachel. You did tell me to interrupt you at some point. Please, yes. <laughs> um, it does sound like we might need to do an ask the experts maybe on pie charts and graphing and global mapper. But I also wanted to say that Mike has some very big fans um, who want to say how much they appreciate his time um, in the beginning of global mapper answering their questions. Um, but I also wanted to ask for one of our audience members if they wanted to request a new tool or feature, how would they get that information to us? That's a very good point. So uh, my final slide, maybe a good segue, my final slide is going to be some contact information. Um, again, you, you may request a feature that's already there, so give us a chance to answer that first. So uh, I would say um, our tech team is probably a good starting point. They are directly connected with the development team. They work in in, in collaboration, so um, that's how that process would start. And truth is, the more people request a particular tool, the more likely it will be to 
to be added. So don't assume that anyone else has added that function or requested that function. Uh, go ahead and put your voice in there and we literally put a, a check marks next to you. We'll let you know directly. And as Mike mentioned, uh, Global Mapper is in a continual state of development. Do, we do release this on an ongoing basis. And if there is a particular tool that we've added, we will provide you with access to that in virtual real time so you can do some initial testing for us. So yes, uh, that, that, um, that is definitely uh, the, way, the way that things work. Any other questions, Rachel, come in that we need to address? Um, we did have a question about um, the LiDAR module actually and how it changed to Pro, but I don't know if that is necessarily applicable here. Well, yeah, obviously somebody who's been along and, and you've been using the LiDAR module, I'll just go ahead and answer that one. Um, the LiDAR module was discontinued with the end of version 22.1. Version 23, we integrated the functionality of the LiDAR module into Global Mapper Pro. So if you want to continue with uh, your point cloud processing tools, including pixels to points, that drone uh, the imagery processing tool that Bob alluded to, that's now part of Global Mapper Pro. Um, and if you're not using Global Mapper Pro, if you have the standard version, you can request a trial of Global Mapper Pro as you can with the software itself. So uh, that's a good question. Which I believe brings us to the end of our session. Looks like Rachel's going to ask another question that just came in. No, no, no. All set. Okay. Um, all that's left for me to do is thank Chuck, Walter, and Bob for taking time away to share. Um, what you do and how you use have used Global Mapper and how you currently use Global Mapper. You know, we can tell the story of Global Mapper from Blue Marble's perspective, but it certainly is a lot more meaningful hearing it from uh, from you folks. So thank you so much, Chuck, uh, Walter, and Bob for uh, for sharing uh, sharing your time with us. I want to suggest, folks, thank we you. just turn off our webcams now. Um, we'll clean up the screen a little bit here, and I'll, all that's left for me to do is show you my final screen here. And I mentioned um, if you have questions. Um, about any of the content that we've covered in this session, or if you want to have your question for one of our presenters, we will make sure we pass on the questions to the appropriate presenter. Um, geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com is the email address uh, that you should use. And indeed, if you have requests for functionality in Global Mapper, that's also the, the email that you should use. If you have questions about licensing, um, we do have network licensing and various other options for licensing. Orders at bluemarblegeo.com is a good uh, um, uh, contact address for that. And if you're one of the 4% of my my poll respondents who have never used Global Mapper, www.bluemarblegeo.com. Look for the link to Global Mapper. You can download a trial, load in your data of those 320 formats. I'm sure it will uh, work with whatever data you have, and you can set up that trial um, if you haven't used it already. Um, folks, thank you very much for joining us for this session. Hopefully you find this useful. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again next week for our final Geotox Express session of the year. And indeed in January, January 26th, for our full day Geotox 2022 conference. Thank you very much, folks. Have a great day. <laughs>